Uh, good day, everyone. Welcome to Northminster Baptist Church online Sunday stream. I hope everyone is having a, a good week so far and a good weekend. Um, I just want to start off reading a portion of scripture that will help us reflect on God's goodness and help us to get into the right frame of mind so that we could praise and worship him wherever we are in our homes, uh, wherever we see this video. So if we could turn to Psalms uh, 145, and it starts off, I will exalt you, my God, the King. I will praise your name forever and ever. Every day I will praise you and extol your name forever and ever. Great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. His greatness no one can fathom. One generation commends your works to another. They tell of your mighty acts. They speak of the glorious splendor of your majesty. And I will meditate on your wonderful works. They tell of the power of your awesome works. And I will proclaim your great deeds. They celebrate your abundant goodness. And joyfully sing of your righteousness. The Lord is gracious and compassionate slow to anger and rich in love. The Lord is good to all, to all. He has compassion on all he has made. All your works praise you, Lord. Your faithfulness people extol you. They tell of the glory of your kingdom, of, of your kingdom and speak of your might, so that all people may know of your mighty acts and the glorious splendor of your kingdom. Your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and your dominion endures throughout all generations. The Lord is trustworthy in all he promises and faithful in all he does. The Lord upholds all who fall and lifts up all who are bowed down. The eyes of all who look to you and you give them their food at the proper time. You open your hand and satisfy the desires of every living thing. The Lord is righteous in all his ways and faithful in all he does. The Lord is near to all who call on him, to all who call on him in truth. He fulfills the desire of those who fear him. He hears their cry and saves them. The Lord watches over all who love him but all the wicked he will destroy. My mouth will speak in praise of the Lord. Let every creature praise his holy name forever and ever. So let's just reflect on that as we praise God, uh, as we uh, go through the video, but also throughout the week, whenever we get a chance, it's always important to remember the goodness of God and to praise him for it. Let's just uh, go into a short opening prayer. Oh, Heavenly Father, I just thank you for today. Lord, I thank you for your graciousness. I ask that, Father, Lord God, as we go into the portion where we uh, listen to uh, music to worship and to praise you, that we would also join our hearts in honoring you and praising you and singing to you. I ask, oh, Father, Lord God, that you would uh, guide us throughout this service, that we would also... Um, have hearts that are close to you and near to you, and that we would enjoy your spirit, enjoy your, your peace, and enjoy all the fruit of the spirit, Lord God. We just bless you and we praise you in the name of Jesus. Amen. At this moment, we will go into some uh, worship music. Let's sing Blessed Be Your Name. Blessed be the name 
suffering, though there's pain in the offering, blessed be your name. And every blessing, every blessing you pour out, all turn back to praise. When the dark Blessed be your glorious name. You give, you give and take away. You give and take away. My heart will choose to say, Lord, blessed be your name. You give, you give and take away. You give and take. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your glorious Give us ears to hear that still, small voice And give us lips forever willing to rejoice And may our eyes be lit with wisdom May we know the path that's true and we'll march with hearts courageous after you. We're marching on with hearts courageous. We'll follow anywhere you want us to. And should you lead us where let us march with hearts courageous after you. And when so is a light along the way, help us to see. hearts courageous after you we're marching on with hearts courageous we'll follow anywhere you want us to and should you hearts courageous after you. Let us march 
Forge with hearts courageous after you. We want to bring before the Lord uh, the request of the congregation. And uh, we know that God knows each individual heart and desire. So you could also join in prayer um, concerning your specific needs. Oh, Heavenly Father, Lord God, I come before your holy throne. And first of all, oh Lord God, we recognize that we are sinners before you, that we are imperfect, that we have fallen short, Father. And we want to thank you for sending your Son, Jesus Christ, to this earth, clothed in human form, to give his life for us. We thank you, Lord God, that he lived a perfect life that we could not live, and he gave himself as a sacrifice for us. Thank you for that, Lord God. Help us to never, ever forget what you have done for us. Lord, we bring before you the different needs of the congregation, Father. You know every single person. You know their individual needs. We bring before you persons who are struggling financially, who may need a job, or struggling in other areas financially, Father, that you would open up the windows of heaven to bless them. You would guide them, Father, Lord God, to the opportunities that you have prepared for them. We ask, O oh Lord God, that you would also help us to be people who are generous. Lord God, generous to your work and uh, generous to those who need help, Father. Lord, we bring before you those who are suffering with different uh, ailments and sicknesses and are recovering from surgeries, Father, Lord God, that your healing hand would touch them, that they would uh, know your power, that they would know that you are with them. They would sense your presence, Father, Lord God, and that even in these difficult situations, you would uplift them and uh, show them your truth, your love, your grace, and that they would be healed by your power, Father, Lord God. We thank you for all you have done for this church. We thank you for the leadership of the church, we ask that you would grant the leadership the wisdom that they need to implement the different, uh, the different goals that uh, we have for the church and that we would implement what you want for the church, Father, Lord God. We ask that you would uh, bless the pastor as well and uh, that the message that would be transmitted today on the stream we touch the hearts of everyone who listens to it and that your divine spirit, Lord God, would, would touch them and uh, that by your grace you would reveal your truth to them. We want to also bring before you the situation of the pandemic. Lord God, uh, there are some restrictions that are being uh, lifted up. Father, Lord God, we ask that people would still... Uh, seek to live their lives, but live it safely, Father, Lord God, and that you would guide us with wisdom to avoid dan dangerous situations, but that we would not live in fear. We would live trusting in you, hoping in you, knowing that our hope is in Christ Jesus, that our hope is not in the government. Lord God, help us to live fearless lives, Father, Lord God but wise as well. Thank you for all your blessings. Guide those who are uh, running the government locally, federally, that the decisions that they make, currently it's putting a strain on uh, many things, Father, Lord God, businesses and people's livelihoods. Lord God, we ask that you would grant them wisdom to make decisions that would be in the benefit of the population, Father. We ask us also, Lord God, that the different bills and agendas that are trying to be implemented, Father, Lord God, which 
is against your principles, Father. I ask that by your grace, your hand would be against these things, Father, and that you would intervene, Father, Lord God, and that we, your people, we would not um, permit that the government uh, brings the country to a point where its back has turned against you, Father. We ask that you would help us to be salt and light in this earth and that we would, uh, through our speech, through our behavior, through our actions, we would, through our prayers as well, that we would uh, be salt, we would be light in this world. We would reach out to those who need help. We would guide those who need guidance. We would evangelize to those who are lost without you. Help us, O oh Father, Lord God, to always keep in mind the priorities that your word has set forth, that you are the most important thing, Father, and your kingdom. And help us, O oh Father, Lord God, to not to let the struggles in life or the joys in life or the pleasures of life to guide us away from our main mission on earth, Father. We just thank you for all that you do for us. Uh, continue to guide any further negotiations with Metrolinx and the property, Father Lord God, we ask that it will be taken care of whilst they are doing the construction, Father Lord God. And uh, we just bless you for all that you do for us, Father. Thank you. Thank you for your son, Jesus Christ. And as we head into this time of Easter, where we reflect on the death and resurrection of Jesus, help us to, to do that, Father, Lord God, to focus on it and to remember that without that, Father, we would not have any chance in our own works to, to be righteous, to obtain salvation. It's only through the work of your son, Jesus Christ, and your grace. So we just thank you for that, and we thank you for your many blessings in our lives. And we ask that your, your peace, your power, your grace would be with the congregation and everyone who listens to this stream as well. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Uh, this time we would turn to Luke chapter 18. verse 18 to 43, where we would uh, read the scripture reading before the pastor comes and uh, delivers the message for today. Luke 18, verse, starting from verse 18. A certain ruler asked him, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Why do you call me good? Jesus answered. No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not murder. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony. Honor your father and mother. All these I have kept since I was a boy, he said. When Jesus heard this, he said to him, You still lack one thing. Sell everything you have and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come and follow me. When he heard this, he became very sad, because he was very wealthy. Jesus looked at him and said, How hard it is for, rich, for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. Indeed, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. Those who heard this asked, who then can be saved? Jesus replied, what is impossible if man is possible with God? Peter said to him, we have left all we had to follow you. Truly I tell you, Jesus said to them, no one who has left home or wife or brothers or sisters or parents or children for the sake of the kingdom of God will fail to receive many times as much in this age and in the age to come, eternal life. Jesus took the twelve aside and told them, We are going to Jeru Jerusalem, and everything that is written by the prophets about the Son of Man will be fulfilled. He will be delivered over to the Gentiles. They will mock him, insult him, 
and spit on him. They will flog him and kill him. On the third day, he will rise again. The disciples did not understand any of this. Its meaning was hidden from them, and they did not know what he was talking about. A blind beggar, as Jesus approached Jericho, a blind man was sitting by the roadside begging. When he heard the crowd going by, he asked, what was happening? They told him, Jesus of Nazareth is passing by. He called out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Those who led the way rebuked him and told him to be quiet. But he shouted all the more, son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus stopped and ordered the man to be brought to him. When he came near, Jesus asked him, What do you want me to do for you? Lord, I want to see, he replied. Jesus said to him, Receive your sight. Your faith has healed you. Immediately, his sight, immediately he received his sight and followed Jesus, praising God. When all the people saw it, they also praised God. May God bless uh, his word to our minds today. And uh, we ask that he would guide us as we listen to the message that is going to be de delivered by Pastor Camille. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone. And uh, we're glad to have you join us today again. Um, and we, our prayer is always that God would speak to us through his word, through these uh, reflections, and then also through the music and the reading of his word. Let me just say a word of prayer as we begin. Father, thank you for the opportunity of uh, having uh, this great privilege of coming together and to hear the preaching of the word to sing your praises, and to listen what you have to say through the message. And we thank you for uh, the assurance that this is the Word of God, inspired, and uh, that teaches us, that corrects us, that leads us, that helps us in every way so that we can live a life that glorifies our God. So be pleased today to speak to us through your Word. May we be attentive and always ready to um, receive the word and to put it into practice in our daily lives. And we thank you for it all in Jesus' name. Amen. As we approach the Passion Week, I would like us to reflect upon Jesus' journey to the cross for the next two Sundays as we look forward to remembering the sufferings of our Lord on our behalf. Jesus is on his final journey to Jerusalem and to celebrate the Passover with his disciples. And uh, as we know from the accounts that have been given to us that uh, Jesus instituted on that night uh, the Lord's Supper, transforming the Passover into the Lord's Supper, pointing to himself as the Lamb of God who would be sacrificed for our sins. And we're going to pick up uh, the story here uh, where we read today that um, Bradley read for us with the rich young ruler. Actually, Luke does not mention that he was young, but Matthew's account tells us he was a rich young ruler. Like many others, he, this man was fascinated with the person of Jesus Christ, and he was intrigued at this uh, unusual, extraordinary, and really out-of-the-ordinary rabbi. This gentleman was a devout Jew, but he was, like others, very uncertain about his a relationship in terms of uh, his um, place with God, his, his standing with God, and he wasn't 
absolutely sure that he had done everything required to merit God's favor. And so it's the same in every other religion that we study. Some people just, no matter how devout they may be, they are never sure that they are good enough or that they have done enough to merit uh, God's favor or to be saved. And so this uh, young man, he comes to Jesus, he had heard about Jesus, and he was impressed, and he felt perhaps he might be able to answer my question. So he comes with this question in mind as he expresses it to Jesus in Luke 18 and verse 18. And uh, Luke says, A certain ruler asked him, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And here we have a very important lesson in this encounter. No matter how devout someone may be, no matter how religious, following all the rules and the rituals and the uh, requirements of one's religion, we find that there is always something that will keep a person from salvation. And here in this case, with this man, it was his wealth. This man was very wealthy, Luke tells us, and therefore his wealth had become his God. And uh, so Jesus knows every person's heart. He can read our minds, he knows our motives, and he knows where that fellow stands, and he knows what he needs. And so Jesus will give him the answer, and the answer Jesus gives him shocks the young man. He never expected to hear that answer from the Lord Jesus Christ. So he's shocked about it. But what we must realize is that even though he never expected that answer, Jesus always puts the finger on the problem that we have, that which keeps us from the kingdom of God. It may be two, three, four things, but it's one thing in particular for sure in each of our lives that we have to deal with. And so Jesus points that to him, but that's exactly what he does not want to hear, but that he must hear. And that all of us must hear, and that's why when we approach the Word of God, we must be open to what God will say to us and not try to cover up, not try to hide behind something, but to be completely transparent with Jesus. So he turned down the Lord Jesus' offer because his money had such a hold on him. And so we read in verses 23 to 25, when he heard this, that Jesus asked him about this one thing he has to give up, to sell everything he has, and to give it to the poor, and then to come and follow Jesus, we are told here, when he heard this, he became very sad, because he was very wealthy. Jesus looked at him and said, how hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. Indeed, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. And that, of course, as we read that account, it is very tragic. Not only is it, is it tragic, it's not in just this fellow's case, it's in many cases. People will always raise up kind of objections as to why they cannot follow Jesus. Jesus in Matthew chapter 6 and verse 24 says most clearly and most emphatically about money and the fact that we cannot Love money and love God, serve money and serve God. And Jesus says 
a verse that we know very well, no one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. So this young ruler, and as he heard that from the Lord Jesus, he turned away. He failed to realize the infinite value and worth of what Jesus was offering him, worth far more than all his wealth. And he failed to realize, to recognize that. And therefore, he went away and lost the opportunity to come to know the real worth of living, of knowing God, and having one sins forgiven, and so on. So the encounter, uh, this encounter led the people who were listening to ask this question to the Lord Jesus Christ. Luke 18, verses 26 and 27. And we read, Those who heard this ask, Who then can be saved? And Jesus replied, What is impossible with man is possible with God. In fact, Jesus' words will prove true a little later on as Luke gives us the account of an example of a rich man, which I believe is intentional to show that what Jesus said is true. With man, it's impossible, but with God, all things are possible. So then we come to the story of Zacchaeus. And for that, we're going to read chapter 19 of Luke, verses 1 to 6. Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through. A man was there by the name of Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector, and he was wealthy. He wanted to see who Jesus was, but because of his, he was short, he could not see over the crowd. And so he ran ahead and climbed the sycamore fig tree to see him, since Jesus was coming that way. When Jesus reached that spot, he looked up and he said to him, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. And so he came down at once and welcomed him gladly. Here's the contrast. This other fellow went away sad. Zacchaeus welcomes Jesus gladly. And God can save anyone he chooses to. But let's remember one thing. God will never impose himself on anyone. God will never twist anybody's arm. He's never going to push anybody to make the right choice. That comes from us. We have to decide. It's a voluntary choice. The wealthy ruler made a bad choice, and he went away sad and lost everything. In contrast, this other wealthy person, the tax collector, Zacchaeus, he made the right choice and welcomed Jesus' offer gladly. That demonstrates definitely that even though with man this is impossible for a rich man to be saved because he has, money has such a hold on his life, and yet with God nothing is impossible, just as Jesus told us in chapter 18, verse 27. Now look at the reaction of those around who were listening and knew what Zacchaeus had done. In verse 7, all the people saw this, and they began to mutter, He has gone to be the guest of a sinner. Zacchaeus was not a sinner any more than they were. They like to label people in order to make themselves look good, look superior, look better, more religious than others. But Zacchaeus 
completely ignored them because his eyes were open and he was able to see something that he could not see before. And uh, we know that he was genuine because of what happens afterwards. That shows us that he was sincere in his decision in welcoming Jesus into his home. Verses 8 to 10. But Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, Lord, look, here and now I give half of my possessions to the poor. And if I have cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay back four times the amount. Jesus said to him, today salvation has come into this house because this man too is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save that which was lost. Jesus does not put labels on people. Jesus takes everybody at wherever they are at. Jesus treats them with dignity and he deals with them according to their needs. And Jesus knows because he cares for everyone despite our condition, our sinful and deplorable conditions that we may be in, Jesus does care and he wants to help. He comes to offer salvation to everyone because he knows we are all lost. We are all incapable of winning God's favor, of doing anything in order to earn our place in heaven. And so here, the Lord Jesus gives us a clear indication of the mission that he is on, as to why he came into the world. And so as he says, for the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. Now, it doesn't tell us anything about how. And so we must ask the question, how will Jesus seek and save the lost. For that, we have to go back to chapter 18 and verses 31 to 37. And we will read that together. Luke 18, verses 31 to 34. Jesus took the twelve aside and told them, We are going to Jerusalem, and everything that is written in the prophets about the Son of Man will be fulfilled. He will be delivered over to the Gentiles. They will mock him, insult him, spit on him. They will flog him and kill him. On the third day, he will rise again. The disciples did not understand any of this. Its meaning was hidden from them, and they did not know what he was talking about. Jesus, on several occasions had told his disciples that he was going over to Jerusalem. He was heading for Jerusalem where he was going to suffer at the hands of the religious leaders as well at the, hand, as a, the hands of the Gentiles. But somehow they did not get it. This is most intriguing. The language that Jesus used is plain. So why? In the world, did they not understand what Jesus was saying? It's as if they were blinded by something. Well, I think, indeed, they were blinded by something. When we read the parallel accounts or passages uh, in the book of Mark, the Gospel of Mark, and in the Gospel of Matthew, we get a pretty good idea what was occupying their minds so much that they did not understand, they did not get the point, and that they were blinded from what Jesus was saying to them. And so, uh, we will read from Matthew, Matthew chapter 20 and verses 20 to 28, and we get an idea where they were at, what was going on in their minds. Verse 20, then the mother of Zebedee's sons came to Jesus with her sons and kneeling down 
Ask a favor of him. What is it you want? He asked. And she said, Grant that one of these two sons of mine may sit at your right hand and the other at your left hand in your kingdom. You don't know what you are asking, Jesus said to them. Can you drink the cup that I'm going to drink? We can, they answered. Jesus said to them, You will indeed drink from my cup, but to sit at my right and left um, is not for me to grant. These places belong to those for whom they have been prepared by my Father. When the ten heard about this, they were indignant with the two brothers. Jesus called them together and said, You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. Not so with you. Instead, Whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first must be your slave. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. And so Jesus had just finished telling them previous to that in verses 17 to 19, that he was going to Jerusalem to suffer and to die and to rise again. And yet, they were not at all on the same page with the Lord Jesus. What was Jesus was saying about his suffering was not on their radar. I think that we would say, as the saying goes, they had selective hearing. They were hearing only what they wanted to hear. Unfortunately, we find that very common among people. When people even come in a service and will sit down and listen, listen to the preaching of the word, very often, if they, their heart is not right with God, they will only hear what they want to hear. And that was the problem with them. And in some ways, we can understand them. Sometimes you and I, we are so focused on one thing. Perhaps we could even use a strong, stronger word. We may be so obsessed with one thing that we become oblivious to everything else that's going on around us. And that is a dangerous place to be. As John MacArthur puts it, the reason... May, may have been that they were enamored with other ideas about the Messiah and how his earthly rule would operate. And because of that, they were not able to understand and to accept what Jesus was saying to them. Each one of them was ambitiously coveting the places of honor in that kingdom that they were anticipating. Previously, we, they were arguing. If we look at chapter 9 and verse 46 and so on, we find out that they were arguing about who was the greatest in the kingdom. So why, where was their mind? Their mind was more on their position, their place of honor, and not at all on what Jesus was saying, on what Jesus was going to suffer on their behalf and on ours. How sad. How sad. And yet we find Christians like that. Christians who are so consumed, so obsessed with the things of this world. It can be one thing or many things, and that they get so preoccupied with these things so that when they read the Word, when they hear the Word preach and so on, it seems to go to one ear and then out the other. It does not touch them how it should touch them. So the application is this. For you and me, we have to be very careful that we do not fall into the same trap let us not be so taken up, so preoccupied with our own ideas of what the Christian life is supposed to be like. 
some traditions we may have, some ideas we might have read here or there that really kind of blocks the Word of God and we don't see the real truth of what the Word of God is teaching and therefore we lose touch with God and we are doing our own thing instead of following the ways of Jesus and we are forfeiting God's plan and God's will for our lives. This is the first thing. The second thing is that you and I must be very careful not to covet high places, positions, titles, acknowledgement when we are serving God. We ought to have rather a position of servanthood. We ought to adopt that kind of attitude even as the Lord Jesus Christ himself when he said, the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to offer his life as a ransom for many. And so Jesus continues on his journey to Jerusalem. And now he approaches a Jericho. And here we have a most beautiful and delightful story that we read about the Lord Jesus. And uh, let us read from 35 to 43 the story of the blind man along the road. Verse 35. As Jesus approached Jericho, a blind man was sitting by the side road begging. When he heard uh, the crowd going by, he asked what was happening. They told him, well, Jesus of Nazareth is passing by. And he called out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Those who led the way rebuked him and told him to be quiet. But he shouted all the more, son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus stopped and he ordered the man to be brought to him. And that is so beautiful because Jesus touches one person at a time. He's interested in the individual. So he tells them to bring the man over and he focuses on this blind beggar and he's going to do something extraordinary for this man. And so Jesus says to him, what do you want me to do for you? Lord, I want to see, he replied. Jesus said to him, Receive your sight. Your faith has healed you. Immediately, he received his sight and followed Jesus, praising God. When all the people saw it, they also praised God. This, there is so much here that we, we could unpack. But I want to focus on one thing for today. The blind man calls out to Jesus and calls him the Son of Man. The Son of Man is a title that refers to the Messiah who was prophesied in the Old Testament who was going to come. He would be called the Son of Man. And this blind man, he had never seen Jesus he didn't know who Jesus was. He only heard report about Jesus. And immediately, despite his blindness, this man believed that Jesus was the Messiah. And so he calls on him. He recognizes him. He acknowledges him. And he calls on him to do something for, for him. In contrast to this blind and poor beggar, is the religious elite in Israel who are, have perfect vision, who have so much knowledge, who have seen Jesus. They have seen the miracles that Jesus did. They have heard him preach the beautiful words that flowed out of his mouth, and yet they rejected him as their Messiah. And they went so far as to call him a demon. Imagine, just think of the contrast between them and this blind beggar. Physically blind, 
but spiritually his eyes were open. And these guys, they were blind, they were uh, seeing physically, they had perfect sight, and yet spiritually they were completely blind. What's the difference? Matthew Henry, in his commentary, makes this uh, word. He says, no one is so blind as those who refuse to see. No one is so blind as those who refuse to see. The whole house of the religious elite of that time, they were willfully blind. They could see, they heard. In fact, Jesus told them at one point, even if you don't believe what I'm telling you, look at the works that I'm doing, referring to the works of God were already predicted in the Old Testament what Messiah would do when he would come into the world. He would heal the sick. He would give sight to the blind and so on. And he says, at least you should believe my works if you don't want to believe my words. And yet, they, their assumed secure position and their privileges in life prevented them from accepting Jesus as the Messiah. So they were blinded by all these privileges that they had, and the Lord Jesus had to denounce them on several occasions. In the end, they completely lost out on the grace of God to redeem them as the people of God. Like Jesus said, what does it profit a man, a woman, if he or she gains the whole world and yet they lose their soul? What does it profit? So there is something of infinite worth that Jesus is offering everybody regardless of who they are, where they come from, their education, their background, or whatever. Jesus is, something, is offering something of infinite worth. And yet sometimes we refuse that because we hang on to these earthly passing things of little value compared to things of eternal value. So let's be careful. Even us Christians, let's be careful that our biases, our traditions, our own theology influenced by men who have been written, who have written many books. Let's be careful that these things do not blind us from the truth about the Lord Jesus Christ and salvation that is found only in Him. In stark contrast to their attitude is that blind beggar. That blind beggar who had perfect spiritual sight, even though he was physically blind. And then eventually, as we know, as we witness here, is that Jesus restored his sight for him physically. So he was able to see, not only with his physical eyes, he was able to see with his spiritual eyes. Look at the fellow's reaction to Jesus' act of kindness towards him. In verses 42 and 43 again. Jesus said to him, Receive your sight. Your faith has made you well. Or your faith has healed you. And immediately he received his sight. And he followed Jesus, praising God as well as all the people who were there. Now Jesus offered this man Two amazing gifts. Two incredible gifts. The first one is the gift of physical sight in order to be able to see the one who gave him his sight. I think that one of the most wonderful things that you and I should look forward to when we get to heaven is to be able to see the face of Jesus. Never mind our loved ones. That will be wonderful too. But most of all, 
We want to see the face of Jesus, our Lord, our Savior, who offered His life as a ransom to redeem us and to bring us into a right relationship with our God. So that was the first gift that Jesus gave to this man. The second gift is the gift of spiritual sight. That he was able to recognize Jesus as the Messiah. Whereas his elders, all these religious leaders, they were totally blind to that and they lost out completely. So this man came to understand Jesus because Jesus opened his spiritual eyes as well so that his faith has made him well. His faith has made him well. And now in closing, let me share this with you. As Jesus journeyed from where he was, passing through Jericho, going to Jerusalem where he was going to offer his life as a sacrifice for us, Jesus encountered many different people. We've seen the the rich young ruler, we've seen the blind beggar, we've seen the tax collector, Zacchaeus, and before that, there was some children that were brought to him for him to bless them, and so on. So Jesus interacted with all these people, and Jesus cared so much for them. He had tremendous compassion, but he was totally honest as to their need, and he wanted to meet their needs, and in particular, Jesus was concerned about their salvation, and that's what he talked about to all of them. And Jesus focused on that, because that's the most important thing. Now, applying it to us, as you and I live in this world, in this day and age, as we move around, as we go to work, to school, or wherever we go, we interact with many people from different backgrounds, with many different kind of uh, educational uh, background, and so from ethnic backgrounds, from languages, and so on and so forth. We meet many people. My prayer is that for all of us, is that we would have the same spirit as Jesus had. That we would see people, not with labels on them, but as real human beings created in God's image and in need of salvation. And that we would be keen to look for every opportunity given to us by the Lord, led by the Spirit, to be able to share the good news of Jesus with them. That Jesus came to seek and to save that which was lost. Amen. Let us pray. Thank you, O Lord, for your word. It teaches us. It corrects us. And today we saw how we can be blinded to see the truth for one reason or another. We pray that you help us not to be blinded by whether tradition or bias or whatever might get in the way, but rather we would be transparent with you. We would be open to your spirit. We would come to your word, hungry for you, thirsty for you, seeking the truth that you have placed in your word. And that we would be concerned for others as well. We know you to be the truth. We know you to be the savior of the world. And help us not to hide that truth. To put, it, put, put that light under a bushel, as it were. As you told us in the Sermon on the Mount. But may we be eager. May we be filled with compassion for those that we encounter in the marketplace at home, in the office, in the school, wherever. Help us, Father, to look at people just as the Lord Jesus did, as those created in your image and who are in need of salvation, so that our lives will count and that we would be doing your will. 
We will not be oblivious to the needs of others around us because we are consumed with our selves, but rather be open to everyone. So bless this word to our hearts as we continue and next week again to think and on Good Friday about the sacrifice that you made, the incredible sacrifice you were willing to make for our salvation. So bless us, Father, as we continue to meditate and to really think deeply about these things that our lives will really count for you and for your glory. Amen. Well, dear folk, thank you for having joined us and uh, we pray that you will have a blessed week and as you continue reading and meditating on uh, what we will celebrate on Good Friday. But then let's not forget that Good Friday is only the offering that Jesus did for you and I. But on Easter Sunday, we're going to celebrate his resurrection. And that's what gives us this hope to know that all his claims were true and that Jesus is indeed the Son of God and that Jesus is coming back one day. God bless you and take care.